Hi, Jay. Um, so um, I have with me um, the CEO of InfraCap Advisors, which is Jay Hatfield. And also he is the fund manager for InfraCap, an, an MLP fund, um, also known, known as AMSA. And we're going to talk a little bit about oil markets and natural gas markets, and then we're going to pivot into a little bit of the electrification, you know, transition ish, transmission issues in the transition. Um, so just to start with some oil market updating. Um, so there's this expectation that, you know, regardless of sanctions and policy interventions, that higher oil prices are still expected, even though we've seen the price, you know, going down a lot today, at least WTI. Um, do you have any kind of thoughts on all that? So we started after the um, Ukrainian war started, we said oil is likely to stay in the 100 to $120 range. And we always use wide ranges because there's just a tremendous amount of noise in the trading of oil in particular. A little less so the refined products, but oil just very noisy. There's a lot of momentum trading because that's the major um, commodity funds use momentum as their major factor. So then though of the dollar, you know, the Fed reduced the money supply 17%, dollar appreciated 15 and 80% of the oil and the world is consumed outside the United States, so they're non-dollar payers. So we reduced our forecast really by 15%. Mm -hmm. So we're at 85 to 105 right now. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, like you might say, well, that's such a wide range, that's useless. But keep in mind, particularly after the Ukraine war hit, a lot of people are saying 150. Right. We just right. didn't believe that. And the, the real dynamic, and I even have this debate with executives in the, in the energy sector too, because they... You know, they, they know a lot about drilling for oil, but they may or may not be able to forecast oil prices that well. But a rough rule of thumb is every $5 increase probably reduces supply and increase or reduces demand and increases supply by, say, a million barrels as just a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So if we're at 85 and we go to 105, then, you know, you're going to get more supply at the margin and you're and you're going to get some conservation and you can't ignore that factor. So we still think that we're in the 85 to 105 range. We do think that it does depend on the weather a fair amount. Um, we had a little bit of cold burst. Now there's a forecast, two week forecast is for a little bit warmer. And you saw European natural gas plummet by 15% when that came out. So you can just see how volatile the natural gas component and it's really natural gas that's underpinning the, not US, but European natural gas prices being about $180 in oil, mm -hmm. a barrel of oil equivalent or $30 in MCF. That's underpinning our bullish stance. So that's why even more so this winter than a normal winter uh, weather matters. And usually North American weather is pretty similar to European weather as well, because it just keeps going across, you know, the, on the jet stream. So we continue to be constructive, see more upside than downside on the on the oil price. Yeah, I mean, but 85, I mean, is that kind of mirroring what's going on with some of the recession talk? Because a lot of the analysts at the Fed conference I was at, they were sort of like, and maybe this was more like January, February, they're saying, oh, you know, we could see, you know, 110 to 120. There's like this expectation there could be, you know, some spikiness once the sanctions number comes out. Like, is the market, um, is there like volatility until the number is chosen of what that price cap could look like? Or is it, I mean, what's your thoughts on the sanction equation and volatility? Well, we, from the beginning, the reason we were never in the 150 camp is that the fundamental um, fact that most politicians don't appreciate fully is that oil is a 100% commodity. It's probably the most, there's right. an economic definition of commodity and oil is sort of the quintessential definition of that type of commodity. So it's right. a world traded easy to ship, relatively easy to ship, and everybody needs it and everybody has export and import facilities. So 
we always felt that those barrels, those Russian barrels would move at a discount to Russia and India. And that's in fact what happened. Right. And then when all this talk about from the politicians about, you know, putting global caps came on, our first reaction was just confusion <laughs> because in effect, there's already global cap. I mean, there's a big discount already. Right. And then, and then we, and we were a little bit nervous about that view of confusion, but then I heard the CEO of Chevron on, on, um, you know, financial news network and said the exact same thing. Like he doesn't even understand it really. Like, what does it mean? Right. So, these barrels are going to move to market. Right. Maybe if you restrict, um, you know, things like insurance that can impact it at the margin, but those barrels were, are very likely when we're at 85, okay, maybe those barrels move at 50, but they're going to get somewhere. Right. You trucked it. You can, you, I mean, you can do a lot of different ways of moving oil. Right. So you can uh, rail it. So it's going to get there some way, somehow. Right. So I don't really think that's, I mean, maybe at the margin that could be worth a couple bucks, but not like 20, 30, $40 a barrel. Right. I was, yes. Yeah, so a comment that kind of struck me at the, um, the conference was that it would be luck if it even works, you know, the sanctions even work. Um, and, and, you know, there will be a Putin response <laughs> that's going to be, um, it's going to be political. So you can't really predict all that per se, you know. Um, so um, the other, so would you say then that those forecasts I mentioned are maybe a little high, the 110 to 120? I could see getting to, you know, our, I would just stick with that range, like, yeah. And the, and the range isn't perfect, obviously, but it is useful, like if you're a trader, because if it goes to 110, then it's probably more of a short than a buy. Right. <laughs> because it's just maybe inflated relative. Because what we're looking at is global supply and demand yeah. of oil by country. So we have our own model. And then, you know, is it out of balance or in balance? And if it's out of balance, by how much? And then what kind of price movement will it need to correct for that? So well, if you're 110, then that's going to, like I said, cause supply and demand responses that could drive it back to into equilibrium. Right. Um, what do you think about, you know, because it seemed like a lot of that was predicated on the little spare capacity story. Um, so are, are we going to, is the globe, the producers going to be able to make up quick enough to, you know, bring balance because of the underinvestment. They don't, yeah, they don't really have the ability to cycle anymore. It used to be that in, in the growth days that they would just add 10 rigs and, and you know, could ramp up production quickly, but the U S production is growing slowly. Um, and that's roughly what's happening in most of the world. Mm -hmm. Just some incremental production, maybe, you know, the North sea is maybe in decline because of political reasons. But so there's not going to be a big surge in supply, but at the margin higher, because the other thing to keep in mind is it's not just oil prices, it's BTUs, global mm -hmm. BTUs are in shortage. Right. So there's, you know, conservation and supply of other, you know, it could be coal, it could be, you know, um, natural gas, there is more natural gas in the United States that could be tapped into. So. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, we think it's a more reasonable. We don't really buy the price spikes, but on the other hand, we do see this, particularly the energy shortage in Europe, being critical. And but on the other side too, that argues against the 110, 120, is Europe is headed into recession. The UK is already in recession. They're not huge um, consumers of oil, but the margin that's just more. That's probably you know could be three or four hundred thousand barrels. Mm -hmm. So. We think that we're going to be roughly in balance, and then the weather will be, you know, determine whether we get into the middle to upper part of the range, or do we just sort of stay at the bottom here where we are today? Um, so, sort of just moving on, you know, obviously diesels in the news, and there's this, you know, shortage or whatever. Um, I guess that's kind of the the result that is expected. Do you have any quick color on the diesel issue? Yeah. So we don't necessarily look at it as a shortage per se but it's an arbitrage opportunity 
because diesel and fuel oil and distal it, which are all the same thing roughly, can be easily shipped, even more easily shipped than oil or about the same to Europe and then be used to displace natural gas demand. And so it's no accident that that um, this, the refined products are trading, if you look at the margins on the refineries, plus the oil at around the same price, about 160, 170, which is where natural gas in Europe is right now as well on a BTU equivalent basis. So that's our view. And I've talked to some industry participants who agree that it's just an, a way of arbitraging the um, differential between energy prices in Europe and the US and yeah. not necessarily some you know, shortage of, of refining capacity or um, some other you know, shortage per se. It's just because the price, the market does clear. So now, you know, if, if you're in the Northeast and, um, you know, like Boston area and it goes to, you know, it, it goes like times five because you're in the middle of a, of a you know, of a, a freeze, then, you know, there's no shortage per se, but you're paying, you know, exorbitant prices. But that's partly a function. Parts of the United States could be in shortage because environmental groups and, and states have opposed putting enough natural gas into, into New England. So it's more, that's more of a structural issue. They always tend to run out of natural gas and then need more distillate because you can run power plants on distillate. Right. So the Northeast is kind of one, not really the Northeast because that includes New York, but like really New England, the Boston area, they could have what would be, most people would refer to as a shortage. But if you have a free market, there, there's never a shortage, just you have a huge spike, you know, price spike. Right. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so moving on to natural gas, um, turn the page here. Um, so how would you characterize? I mean, I know you mentioned that there's a little bit of a warmer period here for the next couple of weeks. Um, and how would you characterize the, you know, pricing and the dynamics in the U.S. and Europe and expectations about that? Well, Europe is definitely driven by the weather. There, oh, there was a big celebration that they have enough storage, but yeah. rarely does storage adequate to carry you through the whole season. I mean, right. it helps, but so, and the other problem with natural gas, a little bit like I was talking about in New England, is that because it's used for power generation and, peop and power generation in today's economy is not optional, mm -hmm. then it does tend to super spike. Mm -hmm. So it was like four or five times as high as it is now in Europe over the summer. So that if it got really cold, that could definitely happen. So Europe is pretty, you know, is really kind of the dynamic. And then to the extent that spikes and it draws our BTUs out of North America. But we're quite constrained on export capacity. And that's why we have this $6 versus $30 roughly range. Right. right. And in, in. right now, I would think that, U.S. natural gas is, could be driven by if Freeport, the Freeport export, LNG export facility comes back online, that would be an upside. Cold weather is an upside. But the converse is that natural gas in the United States is a waste product of drilling for oil, for instance. Yeah, associated gas, yes. Right. And so, yeah. you you know, it's not like you're just saying, oh, you know, gas is at six. So, you know, that's attractive, I'll drill for it, or it's at two and I'm not gonna drill for it. You're drilling for oil and the gas gets produced anyway. Right. It's and you can free. see that, probably the best example of that, there's a hub called Waha that's mm -hmm. in Mexico. The middle. Yeah, it's in, Texas, the, it's in the Permian Basin. Yeah. Well, that for a little, short period of time, that gas is worth zero mm -hmm. because there was constraints on getting it into the ship channel or getting it into the major markets on pipelines because there's limited natural gas pipeline capacity coming out of there. Right. So that's just a good example of where um, U.S. prices are mo more likely to be subdued unless we, um, you know, can develop this export capacity relatively quickly. I mean, you can make fertilizer. There's other, other ways to arbitrage the differential mm -hmm. and it does benefit our manufacturers. Right. But all that's relatively slow. And then U.S. production is increasing, um, notwithstanding, you know, sort of impressions to the contrary. It's gradually increasing, which means 
that even if it's not the driving factor, you're still going to have more natural gas because there's more oil drilling. Right. Well, and it's and and so are we still saying that Europe is a bit is short aside from storage? So they're not going to have the flow, and then our LNG isn't going to be able to flow because of our our you know our constraints on exporting. <laughs> One thing I did hear here at this Fed conference, um, they had some sort of intel whispers about that Freeport um, opening, and 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 they they are thinking that there's going to be like 85% capacity coming online and then you know, in some near future, not, it's not like going to be a long, long time kind of thing. That's just kind of what yeah, I Yeah, Freeport heard. should come, I mean, it's an operating LNG facility. So there have huge incentives to get it online. So. Right, right. And it's um, been delayed a couple of times. So I don't know, the, because it's been delayed, you can't really, it's hard to predict exactly right. when it'll come online, but you would think it would be weeks or months, not, you know, six months or a year. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like it was sooner than later kind of thing. Right. Um, but, um, and then yeah, and this idea that um, that even if we produce more oil, the associated gas, um, even if the price goes higher of natural gas, that it might not yield more production just because of the dynamics in the United States. Um, yeah, oil... Increased oil supply in the Permian can increase some of that. And surprisingly, <laughs> there was talk about, um, you know, that there's some movement to the gassier side of the Permian, too. We know that's in the Delaware. Um, but um, and then, um, you know, policy headwinds, you know, with this underutilization of natural gas um, can cause CO2 emissions to be worse because of the oil coal fuel switching. And we've talked about that some before um, as well. I mean, is there anything you want to add quickly on that? And then we can move on. Well, I just think in terms of US supply, we are pipeline constrained because the Biden administration's cancellation of the, um, of the Keystone pipeline really put almost all development of pipelines on hold. And then they've tightened up the regulations. So you have to do a statement of impact on carbon, which is, extremely difficult to do. So um, there's trapped gas in Appalachia, Mountain Valley Pipeline is 98% built, Man even Mansion can get that approved. So the ability for the US to surge is still there, but it's constrained to some degree by pipeline capacity. Yeah, um, kind of switching hats a little bit, um, just a little bit about electrification and, tra and the transmission um, issue. Um, it seems like transmission is 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 a very great inhibitor, and and and, and this is also I'm really focusing more on like a Texas context. Um, you know, we have all these wind resources in the Panhandle, and then we also have a lot of solar resources in West Texas, and and there's challenges with moving that to demand centers. Um, and obviously there's a lot of obstacles with transmission, um, you know, this in connecting to the grid. Um, do you have any kind of thoughts on, on that and within a Texas context? Well, I think that the, what a lot of people don't appreciate is that every constraint on producing, um, hydrocarbons is also a constraint on producing renewables. Right. So siting for instance, is a huge issue. Um, and again, the, I mean, it's FERC, but FERC does regulate transmission lines, but probably, I'm not certain of this, but the, they're gonna make it more difficult de facto to site transmission lines as well, because probably have to do a carbon statement for that as well. Mm -hmm. But as an example of that, there's been a number of offshore wind projects in the Eastern United States that have actually been opposed by groups that you would think would be environmentalist, mm -hmm. so it's fishermen. Uh, sometimes it's it's landowners who the transmission lines are going to go across their land. Yeah, not that my this bitterly, right? So it's this issue of being able to develop infrastructure is not limited to hydrocarbons. I mean, hydrocarbons tend you know infrastructure like the natural gas pipeline that was supposed to go to New England do get opposed by environmentalists because it's more visible, but all the normal difficulties in getting siting 
doing environmental impact statements, they apply to renewables just like they do to, to hydrocarbon. So none of this is going to happen particularly quickly. And that's why the, you know, the Europeans as the, as kind of the poster child were, you know, probably too aggressive or not even probably too aggressive about eliminating hydrocarbons because developing the other resources has constraints. And then of course, the problem with renewables as well as they have zero compat what's called capacity or the ability to deliver energy on demand and so you you have to plan your grid accordingly right and so that was kind of another key problem yeah but so there i think there people tend to be assumed that the energy markets are going to move like their software companies <laughs> when yeah. it's not possible it's not right possible. We're not like doing Moore's law and creating chips that are, you know, an order of magnitude more efficient all the time. It's slow incremental progress and it takes a lot of capital and it's difficult to get cited. So these changes are going to be highly incremental. And the reason I kind of know that is I started working on renewables 30 years ago, mm -hmm. was the first renewables investment banker. And there's been some development but it's been it's just it's just fundamentally slow and is likely to continue to be relatively slow um you know we we hear you know oh there's all this increased you know solar and wind generation being built and and we know there's obstacles that starting to reveal in terms of you know the permitting and you know those right. kind of slowdowns so is this just and even though all this government money just went pouring into the industry so are you saying that even in spite of all that, even in spite of all the optimism and the subsidies and everything, that it's still going to be constrained because of the physical reality, the policy, and the capital constraints with higher interest rates that therefore make, you know, the project threshold higher, you know, um, is all well, so yeah, fair? I would I would agree with that. the The key um, dynamic is well, there's kind of two dynamics. The first is that there's a comment that well, the first thing to understand is just the overall arithmetic of it. Of it. If yeah. you look at total energy um, demand, so not just electricity, but all energy, including right. transportation fuels, pure renewables. So that's just uh, solar and wind is less than 5% right, right. of overall demand. So then if it if that's if you if you take that as a starting point, if you're at 5% and it's been growing 10% a year, maybe you double that to 20, but then that's still 5 6, you know, 6.2, 7.4. Right, right. It's and not so, the numbers that people think it is by hearing the 10% growth, 20% growth. Yeah, it's incremental growth. And there's a mathematical equation. You've got to know your math to be able to. Right. So that's just the arithmetic of it. And then also, yeah. because there can be confusion, because about 20% of US generation is renewables. Right. But it's only about 8% pure, what I call pure renewables. So solar and wind. And I call them pure renewables because. Nuclear is extremely, in the United States at least, extremely unlikely to be expanded anytime soon mm -hmm. because of just heinous, you know, um, opposite local opposition for good reason. Right. Right. <laughs> and then geothermal is very limited as well. And right. then, of course, hydro might even be harder to site or get approved than nuclear because you get you have to dam up rivers and right. That's right. arguably. Uh, an abomination right anyway, so right. you can't take that 20 percent and say okay if we grow that at 30 percent a year then we'll be 20 26 32 and we'll, it'll right. be done in 10 years so because first of all that's total renewables you know 12 percent of which aren't growing at all and then you're also ignoring that the, there's another 50 percent are transportation fuels industrial fuels the rest of the energy demands not just producing electricity Right. So that's just the arithmetic of it. I mean, it is, I think it's worthwhile. It's a little bit uneconomic in the sense that the U.S. is not going to solve the carbon, global carbon problem. But what is great about renewables is that it reduces, to the extent it reduces particularly coal, coal yes. other emissions right. that affect this part of the world 
right. more than the rest of the world. So if we can eliminate Sox, Knox, Mercury, right. uh, soot, then yeah. that's probably worth all the subsidies. Sure. So I'm yeah. not too concerned about that being a waste. I just right. don't think that's going to really move the needle when China is adding 40 gigawatts of coal-fired generation. So they add 40 and we close down 15. So that doesn't sound like very good math either. Yeah. Well, uh, and the other thing I wonder is, you know, if we're spending this money on, you know, cleaner sources, efficiency, surely some innovation will be had from the money being spent, aside from the local pollution issue, which is huge and important, and we need that. Um, I just wonder if it might help spark innovation with, you know, in some way, you know, how to use it better, you know, better technology, that kind of thing. I mean, that's there's definitely always... true. But the other thing that's true about solar and wind is you can't really, and you can't really say this about any type of power, but you can't say, oh, it's definitely cheaper than natural gas. Right. Because it's 100%, or not 100%, but um, it's dependent, it's ultimate costs and efficiency is dependent on location. Mm -hmm. and, right. resource, and resource, wind resource, right. solar resource, and as you pointed out, transmission costs. So the the notion that it's just ubiquitously way cheaper than other supplies is absolutely not true. Right. It could be true, any particular project might be, not it's probably close to break even, but um, the other dynamic that could limit the growth of renewables to the extent they are being put into uneconomic type situations is that ultimately it shows up in electricity bills. Right. And so at some point, you know, we break the camel's back. Right. You know, for instance, in California, uh, you know, they have some of the highest electricity prices in the nation. So you can do these yeah. transitions, but if you're doing them uneconomically, ultimately the ratepayers are going to right out of the state yeah, so there's pressures on both sides and it can't, right. it can't really be done infinitely fast so that's why actually i would just mention that if you because you talked about innovation they by far and everybody pretty much agrees on this it's just can't really get it done politically but by far the best approach to limiting carbon and all pollution pollutants is to tax them or yeah. de facto tax them with cap right. and trade or and right. that's being worked on by the you know global climate organization. But what's great about that is then you let the market innovate around. Right. It doesn't have to be some breakthrough in technology like a right. small nuclear plant. It could just be like you know what the it's we're getting three hundred dollars a ton of carbon, and I can go insulate homes for twenty five dollars a ton. Mm -hmm. And so that actually is the most economic thing by far. So then there's like 4,000 companies that just go around, you know, I'm not saying that's necessarily true, but that could be an example. Like, actually, we shouldn't be building charging stations. We shouldn't be subsidizing renewables. We should just first knock off, or, or actually the better example that I'm sure confident is more true, is that you just close down all the coal as rapidly as possible and substitute whatever else you can, whether it's natural gas or renewables right. or conservation. If you just did that in the next three years, you clearly would reduce carbon. I mean, you, you might reduce carbon the most, that might be the most optimal thing, but definitely from a total pollution standpoint, because of the mercury and ash, and soot, that would be the most economic thing by far. But right. we don't have, you know, we have politicians deciding not, not the market. So they think the charging stations are cool. And also there's a bunch of companies lobbying them to produce them. Right. Whereas there's no constituency for shutting down coal. There's actually opposition to that. Right. So it's, but it's critical. If anybody really wants to solve the problem, yeah, they should just focus not on their own carbon footprint or protesting a natural gas pipeline, but on trying to get a global um, pricing of carbon that then induces the market to figure out the optimal way to reduce carbon. So, and in, in to your carbon question, because I've been thinking about this more and I'm trying to sort of get under the hood of it a little bit. And that is, you know, these carbon ETFs and all the various carbon markets, voluntary, involuntary, this, that, you know, there's a lot of it spinning around. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, these carbon ETFs? Are they just, 
moving money around? Is it just like a fun that's, oh, here, this is a nice marketing idea? Or is it really, I mean, it's trying to put a price, right? <laughs> on carbon it's trying to price it so i wonder if maybe that's helpful or you know well it is it's just limited to the the main etfs i'm aware of are in europe and so europe has an effective you know cost of carbon uh, it's roughly about a hundred dollars a ton and there's a futures market and so those etfs just track the futures market yeah so it's um i mean to the extent that people buy it i guess it bids up the price of carbon a little bit so there would be maybe some reduction but yeah, it's a, a good example where you can it's one just one mechanism to make the market more liquid and efficient. And so that people can trade them easily. And you can do those offsets where you say, well, actually, let's not build, you know, 50 billion of charging stations that are going to be underutilized that actually increase carbon, probably or right. increase carbon. <laughs> and you can kind of resources. <laughs> yeah, if they're underutilized, then almost certainly they would because you were you're creating carbon activity. But instead of doing that, that's the you know the least economic thing. Why don't we shut down the coal? So, but you need an efficient market. So, to the extent that any ETF or other mechanism could do that. Now, it's I would, it's all, much more difficult to get approved from a political perspective. But it's more economic and can be more flexible to actually tax the pollution. So then you get revenue. Because a lot of like third world countries during COP27 were asking for, you know, subsidies or reparations or payments, right? Which is perfectly reasonable. Just like it's reasonable to pay coal-fired plants to shut down, sure. They don't want the ratepayers to take a hit, and to pay subsidies to the miners, you know, maybe top up their pensions, and maybe to localities that get disadvantaged. So then you have a, if you have a tax, you have revenue streams right. that then can be utilized to offset negative right. impacts of the tax. Right. So the, I, I think that's superior, but taxes are, um, spending is very popular for right. politicians <laughs> and taxes are very unpopular. So it's easy to get a bill to spend money on charging stations and renewable subsidies, but really, really hard to get a, a bill to tax you know, mercury pollution. Right. And, and, you know, there was the news today about, you know, the UK is having to go towards us. They're going on austerity mode. They're going to start trying to spend less and tax more. And there was a lot of reaction to that. And obviously it's not popular, but, but it is reality, right? I mean, they, you know, they're not, you can only print so much money. You can, only, you know, and- no, they're definitely, I mean, there's what most people don't appreciate about government spending is unless you have mass unemployment, it just crowds out private investment. Mm -hmm. This is not, and this is not like really that controversial among economists. So um, spending for growth usually doesn't work. So you do have to um, be cautious about that. And it has negative economic consequences that we've sort of forgot about during the pandemic. I guess we're experiencing right now. Right. And one other question too, is just about uh, swinging back to commodities. Yeah. Um, so um, there was this chart that was shown by um, on the first panel and it was just showing how relatively speaking, all commodity prices are high oil, natural gas, lithium, various minerals, you know, they're all high. And, and so the cost, the cost of renewables is going to go up. And we haven't even seen all that movie yet, um, making those inputs more expensive. Um, and then we've got higher costs of capital, you know, uh, limiting projects and, and, you know, people have to you know, use cost benefit analysis and all sorts of things you do when you choose to invest in something. So between those two factors, um, you know, it, it doesn't bode well for this energy transition and it doesn't bode well from what I, I'm hearing you say for adding transmission in all this uncertainty in this higher cost environment I mean, there's got to be a lot of political will and they got to know where to spend the money and they're not spending it 
in that IRA policy, they're not spent. I don't, I didn't see anywhere where they're spending it on transmission, you know, to plonk into the grid. It just seemed like it was all these, you know, low, obvious candidates, if you will, <laughs> that would be getting the money, you know, hydrogen and, you know, um, solar wind, this, that, and the other, some nature, some money to nature, which is great. Um, you know, so, I mean, what are your thoughts about well, I think there's a couple things that if you we did an estimate that if every car in the world was electric, you would need 10 times the production capacity that we have of lithium. Right. Which sounds, oh, just 10 times, but that's like a 900 percent increase. Right. So that's obviously going to cause costs to skyrocket. Now, there can be technological innovations, but they take sure. a long time. Right. And so this is what people are missing the time element. But yeah. so that there that's why you really don't want command and control on these solutions. Right. Because you're probably going to go down an uneconomic rat hole. Right. Like we were saying, you know, because if in fact you're looking at a new, say, renewable project, wind project, and it requires a new transmission line. That can make that project massively, if you actually loaded the project properly with the cost, massively uneconomic, which you say, well, we don't care because of carbon. But at some point, the real constraint on limiting carbon is the economic capacity to absorb those costs. Right. So if you do it initially in the most uneconomic way, <laughs> then you burn up the sort of the world excess uh, you know, GDP that could be dedicated to that. Right. So that's why it's really important to price it. And then when you do price it through a tax, you know, the U.S. could very well have the capacity to get to whatever production level, you know, whatever production level of carbon would be acceptable because we have tremendous surplus. But a lot, most of the rest of the world does not. So to the extent that revenue was raised globally could be directed in those countries and used to, you um, you know, increase the taxes or, or subsidies that would offset taxes that say individuals don't have. Um, because if you do tax carbon, it ultimately gets passed through to ratepayers. So you could use the money for subsidies, but it's really critical to not have these utopian notions of what's going to solve the problem, but let the right. free market do it and, yeah. and figure out because what we want is the most cost efficient way to do it. And it, you know, doing these carbon calculations is extremely difficult. Yeah. Like if you're really to calculate, okay, we're spending whatever the number is. I think it's fifty billion, but whatever we're spending on charging stations, that creates a tremendous carbon footprint to to all the manufacturing installation of right. those charging stations. And then how many, how util, how utilized would they have to be? And then the other issue is, well, most, a lot of electric cars really, if you look at the balance pretty carefully, but again, this can be argued ad infinitum, is pretty neutral on carbon. Mm -hmm. Fantastic for the local environment. So you don't have burning gasoline in, in a big cities, but pretty close to neutral when you go through the whole value chain. But these right. calcs, like we probably have like a seminar, we could just all have 50 people argue about, well, no, it's economic. Here's my model. Here's my yeah. model. It's economic. But that's why if you price carbon, then you don't have to have those conversations. All, okay. pro all products include the cost of carbon. Yeah, you know really, what? I mean, that's what's happening. And, and I think this is, like I said, this isn't even that controversial, yeah. but it's just hard to implement. And so it's been slow to happen in the global climate discussion. Well, and it seems like, I mean, even from this Fed conference, I mean, I asked some carbon questions Nobody had answers and nobody had good answers per se of some questions I had. And, you know, can you get this reduced carbon without 45Q? You know, and nobody touched that. It's interesting. Maybe they don't, they're not thinking about it either. The different people that were there. I know who is thinking about 45Q, you know, um, I can name those firms. But um, so, yeah, it's, there's a lot to unpack and keep, you know, discussing what is truthful and practical and doable. And, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do with these discussions as well. I think, and you are, um, 
but yeah, the timeline matters and everybody's in a hurry, but all that planning needed to be done yesterday for a lot of these things. That's why though the real emergency should be to price carbon, because once you do do that on a global level, then you can instantaneously, relatively instantaneously reduce carbon. So in other words, if you yeah. had a hundred dollar, um, and it particularly if it's a tax versus cap and trade. So if it's at a hundred and you say, oh my God, there's a, you know, now there's a real emergency, like whatever it is. And so we need to take carbon down by X percent. Well, then you raise it to a thousand dollars a ton, and if that doesn't do the job, you raise it to two thousand. But you can do those, make those decisions overnight. Right. Versus right. like, oh, we're going to go, you know, <clears throat> create subsidies for solar. That's going to take a long, long, long time to implement. But you send this market signal. Right. And then there's still a lag, but but people yes. might shut down production facilities. They might take immediate action, or they'll say, well, now there's a clear economic signal. That we need to go shut down that 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 um, coal-fired power plant because it's just now it's like we're losing tremendous money like every day and that just happened yesterday so we're going to shut it down tomorrow. Well, and the other thing too is it behaviorally sends a signal to consumers when they work out that oh with this high carbon price oh gosh I better drive less oh I need to con assume less electricity because I'm just all like, that will happen relatively quickly. Yeah. I mean, the way I say it is the best environmentalist is an economist. Right. The mistake is that we're by not taxing carbon and other pollutants, we're implicitly encouraging people to produce them because right. we're not pricing them. Everything else is priced, right. labor is priced, materials are priced, but not pollution. Yeah. So in effect, our system incentivizes people to pollute as much as they possibly can. <laughs> so, but if you price that, then the economics would work to your advantage. Right. Wow. Long way to go. Ho hopefully not too long. Um, well, Jay, um, thank you. I'll stop recording. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, really appreciate your time. Yeah, hopefully it's helpful. Hang on one second.